Welcome to the Church Universal Series, where we seek to tell the often untold story of the many apostolates in the Catholic Church which are making a positive difference in the world through their charitable works and prayerful lives. The Roman Catholic Church is made up of the Latin or Western Catholic Church and 23 Eastern Catholic Churches, each of which has its own contribution to make in bringing people to Jesus Christ. One of these Eastern Catholic Churches is the Lebanese Maronite Church, which we will be discussing today. My guest via Skype is His Excellency Bishop Antoine Charbel Tarabé, Maronite Bishop of Australia. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you for having me, and I am pleased to be with you for this interview, talking about the Maronite Church, which is now it's becoming a universal church. Now tell us, Your Excellency, where and when the Maronite Church began. The Maronite Church has a history which is a little bit different from the history of the other Eastern churches as you mentioned, Father Joseph, at the beginning of this interview about the 23 Eastern churches uh, and alongside with the Roman Catholic Church, which is, it is the one universal church. And uh, the history of the Maronite Church started with a, a monk, a hermit, and a priest, Saint Maroon, who lived around the uh, end of the fourth century, beginning of the fifth century, and died, we say, around the 410, in or after 410, uh, in, in uh, northern Syria, in an area, he lived up in the mountains, the mountains of Korosh. And uh, we can say that, firstly, the, the Maronites, uh, as a church, we didn't start from the beginning as a church. Initially, uh, w there was what we call a monastic movement led by our father, St. Maroon. And that monastic movement, which is, uh, we go back to him, it's a movement of spirituality and it's a movement of learning and living the faith and the gospel values led by St. Maroon. So that movement, after the death of St. Maroon, led to build a monastery. That monastery is called Beit Maroon, which is, was built around the years 452. So we have now two dates, the death of St. Maroon mm -hmm. and his example, and the monastery which the disciple of St. Maroon built that monastery and from that monastery, they were preaching the good news of the gospel to the people in the, in the region. And at that time, <clears throat> we can say that the people converted to Christianity with the disciples of St. Maroon were called Maronite. And that movement back then, we, it, it started without having a church, a patriarchal church as we have now, because the patriarchal church only started in the year 685, and which is with the first Maronite patriarch for Antioch, St. John Maroon. And the reason behind that was Antioch, after the death of uh, the patriarch Anastasius in the years 609, they couldn't elect a new patriarch for many reasons. And the see of Antioch was vacant for, from that date until 685, when the monks of Beit Maroon, of the monastery of St. Maroon, decided to elect their superior, John Maroon, as a patriarch. And then, from that date, with the election of St. Maroon, St. John Maroon, who moved from the Beit Maroon in Syria to Lebanon, to the monastery, named after him later on, the monastery of St. John Maroon in Kfarhai, North Lebanon. This is the date when we can say that the Maronite church started as a church, as the patriarchal church. 
How would you describe the identity of the Maronite Church? In our Maronite Patriarchal Synod, there, there was a lot of discussion about the identity. And the conclusion, we come to six main elements forming the Maronite identity. And I will read it because these are very much important for the spectators and for all of us to understand what are the uh, what is the identity and the element, the features of this Maronite church that we're talking about today. Um, firstly, the first element in this identity is the liturgical, spiritual, disciplinary, and Syriac, monastic, Antiochian heritage, initiate, initially lived by Saint Maroon and his disciples. So here we're talking about the liturgy and the spirituality. And allow me to say that uh, if I will go back again and say that the Maronite Church is born from the spirituality of Saint Maroon and the life, the monastic life of the monks, the followers of Saint Maroon. Then the first element that it is something like uh, a distinctive, a distinctive feature for the Maronite Church is the liturgy. And here we're talking about a monastic Antiochian liturgy. And when we talk about that monastic aspect, as I spoke initially that the Maron Church is a monastic church, we have to understand that in the tradition of the Antiochian uh, uh, church, we have two kinds, I would say, of monastic life. We're talking about the anachoretic or Cenobitic. Mm -hmm. The anachoretic style of life is the life of the hermits, similar to Saint Maroon. And the monks used to, to live this kind of ascetic life all together in the monastery, but individually, as was the example of Saint Maroon. And when we talk about this Cenobitic life, which is now common in our Maronite church, it is the community life of monks together. So, and here we can say that the liturgy, the, the beginning of that liturgy, it is the liturgical, uh, the liturgy of the monks. And at the same time, it has uh, the Syriac aspect of it. And here we, uh, we go back to Antioch, the church of Antioch, where we have different liturgical families. One of them is the Syriac uh, liturgical family. Under the Syriac, the liturgical family, we have mainly three churches. We talk about the Syriac Orthodox Church. We can talk about the Antiochian Greek Orthodox Church, and they speak Syriac and Greek, and also the Syro Maronite Church. So here we talk about the first element, the first component of that identity of the Maronite Church. The second one is the Mariological and Christo Christological spirituality of the councils of Ephesus, 431, and Chalcedon, 451. And here we, we are talking about the dogma of the church. When we talk about the Maronite church, we know that the question of Our Lady, the Mother of God, as we say in Aramaic, Yoldat Aloho, and was very much crucial when it comes to the Maronite following the teaching of the Synod of Ephesus 431. And also the Maronite followed the teaching of the Council of Chalcedonian on 451 about the divine and the human nature of Jesus Christ, the two nature of Jesus Christ. They followed this as following the teaching of this council. The third element is the institution of the Patriarchate which, with the election of St. John Maroon to the See of Antioch in the years 686. So here we're talking about the beginning, the starting of the Maronite Church as a patriarchal church, as one of the patriarchal church of Antioch, because in Antioch now we have different patriarchs for Antioch and Orthodox and Catholic and Maronite. 
And the fourth is our constant union with the Roman see of St. Peter. And here I'd like to say that the Maronite church as uh, a church, we're not part of the Uniat church. And here we, I explained to say, from the beginning until now, we have been in union with the Holy See, with, uh, with the Pope and the successor of St. Peter, and following the, all the doctrines and the teaching of the councils. And it is the only like Eastern Church that has this aspect of keeping the unity all the way from the beginning until now. And God willing, it will continue for the future. Yes. And uh, the fifth is our belonging to the Oriental world with an ecumenical dimension and a dimension of interreligious dialogue, especially with Muslims. For sure, our context as Maronite Church in the Middle East and now in the world, but mainly in the Middle East beforehand, it was an opportunity for us to open up for the dialogue the, with the other uh, uh, Christian denominations around us with the Orthodox or with the other churches the, the, like the Assyrian and also it was an opportunity for us to be open to the dialogue with the Muslims in the Middle East and this is something that also the Marana Church is keen to continue in playing this role of open up to the dialogue with the other churches and the Muslim world in the Middle East. And the last one and the number six element is the expansion to the five continents with Maronites inculturate, inculturating in different countries and enriching their cultures. So now we're talking about the expansion of the Maronite going all in the different <coughs> countries in many countries all over the world, and bringing with them that Eastern tradition and that Eastern spirituality. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, you yourself are a monk. Would that be typical of priests and bishops of the Maronite Rite? As the Maronite Church is a monastic church, and the tradition in our church that when it comes to the dioceses and parishes, especially the parishes, usually they have a married priest to run the parishes. And for the bishop and the patriarch, as we spoke about the first patriarch was elected by the monks and he was a monk. And also he uh, chosen other monks to be uh, his auxiliary bishops. They were from the monks. So the tradition in the Maronite church that bishop, they are elected from the monks and also patriarchs. And then usually parish priests are from the diocesan priest and uh, they will be married. However, this tradition was changed in the 19th and 20th century because uh, based on uh, the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, we started to have a celibate priest in the diocese and uh, from the diocesan priest they start electing bishops and patriarchs and now we keep in our church the two traditions the celibate priest and then the married priest to serve the parishes when was the maronite eparchy of australia established and how large is it um, the immigration of maronites from Lebanon and some other countries from the Middle East to Australia started in the 19th century. So I will say uh, every, uh, after every conflict in the Middle East, especially in Lebanon, we witnessed a wave of immigration. And that started, let's say, after the 1840 conflict, after the 1860 conflict, after the First World War, the Second World War, and then after the Lebanese War started in 1975. So we have waves of immigration. But I would say the first Maronite church that was uh, consecrated 
in Australia goes back to 1895. And back then, two priests came from Lebanon and they start serving the Maronite community back then in Australia, in Sydney. And uh, now the, uh, the uh, Maronite eparchy was established in 1973. 1973, and uh, back then we had a uh, few parishes, and since then, uh, and uh, before the establishment of the Maronite uh, eparchy, we had here in Australia the uh, religious congregation, the uh, Maronite Sister of the Holy Family, and the Lebanese Mar Maronite Order of Monks, which is my order as well. I, I, I come from the uh, Lebanese Maronite Order of Monks. So they were there before the establishment of the eparchy. However, moving forward, now I am the fourth bishop after uh, 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 and uh, we have around um, uh, 18 parishes and mass centers uh, serving in our eparchy now, uh, all the number of clergy altogether, they are uh, 73, including retired deacons, subdeacons, married clergy, and celibate clergy. So the Maronite church has known conflict and it remains in the Middle East in large part, a Christian presence in the Middle East, and that's so important today. When, it, when we talk about like the presence of the Maronite Church in the Middle East or the presence of the other Eastern churches in the Middle East, um, now the Christian presence in the Middle East is facing a lot of challenges. And uh, the numbers are decreasing. Uh, at the same time, we know that uh, the Holy See uh, during the time of uh, Pope Benedict, they held a, a special synod for the Church of the Middle East. And they were trying to like work out how can we like keep and support and promote the presence of the Christians in the Middle East. Uh, for sure, this is a very delicate subject because there is a lot of political factors, economical factors, and also because we uh, there is a lot of places where the Christians of the Middle East are uh, facing the persecutions. And uh, here, what I can say about it, that uh, being now the Bishop of the Maronite Church in Australia, and we having a council of the Eastern churches, we are keen to do whatever to support our mother churches in the Middle East, because we are aware that without our mother churches staying and continuing to give witness to the Lord in the Middle East, we have no identity to be a churches, to be diocese outside in the expansion and in Australia, United States or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for all of us to understand <coughs> that we have a role to support and to, to do whatever we can to support the existence and the presence of the churches and the uh, patriarchates in the Middle East. Now in your eparchy in Australia, what are some of the highlights of the Maronite Church there, organizations and activities that you're involved in helping the church in Australia? I can talk about uh, uh, four highlights in the Maronite eparchies of Australia. Uh, firstly, uh, since like I, I started in 2013, after my appointment as a bishop, uh, uh, I put a plan together to start new parishes. I put a plan for seven new parishes, and now we're coming to the conclusion of uh, this seven, uh, seven years plan, and we, by the grace of God, and then we uh, established five of them, five new parishes, uh, adding to the existing parishes, which now we are around the 18 parishes altogether. And uh, we still have two, new, two parishes. We're working on like uh, establishing them to have the, all the seven new parishes done. And this is based on the growth of the Maronite community in Australia. We are a growing diocese and a growing community and this is coming not only from immigration. Now, 
less from immigration, but now from birth. And here I can talk about our christening, yearly christening in our uh, parishes. We are doing more than 1,500 christening per year. Mm. And even uh, this is like, I would say, uh, average number. Sometimes it's much yes. more. And uh, uh, this is where we can say that we have to plan for the future for new parishes, for the new families that they are moving to new areas. And the second um, uh, highlight of our work as a church <coughs> is Maronite <coughs> Care. <coughs> and this is our social agency where we have developed um, a counseling uh, department uh, mainly for uh, addictions, drugs, alcohol, uh, gambling, uh, marriage counseling, and also we run the pre-marriage course in preparation for marriage. And uh, we are also uh, trying to uh, establish now and soon we will be starting an aged care center because we have shortage in aged care centers in our Maronite community. We have uh, three centers now or four centers, but still it's very short given the number of the community, which is we're talking about uh, 250,000 of Maronites in Australia altogether. Um, and this is where we can give that uh, uh, agency, the Maronite care, we're giving it an attention to move forward and to be more developed and to be more at the service of the community and the wider community. It's not only like for the Maronite, it's for whoever uh, would come and ask for seeking help or assistance in, in any problem that they are facing. And the third one is the Maronite on mission. And this is here, uh, this group, it's linked to our youth group and uh, the Maronite youth here in Australia. And we started that together with them back in 2011 and 12. And every year we have a group of people from young people that will go to uh, some countries, underdeveloped countries, and they will do fundraiser here and they will go and assist and try to help with the poorest of the poor. And we have like an annual basis, a mission going to the Philippines, to Naga and the Philippines to assist the poorest of the poor there. And this was, it was going now for more than six years. And the Maronite on mission, now they are developing to go to Lebanon, maybe Africa, South America, and to organize this mission of the youth to go out there and to do like a charitable work. And this charitable work will help them in their journey of faith. And they will think about uh, how they are conducting their life and they don't take things for granted from their parents. And many parents will come back to me saying thank you because uh, after the mission that uh, my son and my daughter went to uh, Philippines or somewhere else, mm -hmm. it, they coming back and they changed. They changed in their way of looking at things. And we have another group is Heaven on Earth uh, in Our Lady of Lebanon Parish. Also, they are doing the same. So I believe this is something that we're very keen to develop and to move forward with it. And uh, the final point is about the uh, our uh, Maronite uh, Diocesan Assembly. And we started to have like every year a topic to to run during uh, uh, the year and to reflect upon. This year was the Maronite spirituality year in our on all our parishes and dioceses. And I believe it was very fruitful to invite all the Maronites, all of us, to in this journey towards holiness in today's world. Your Excellency, we've come to the end of our program here. Any closing comments or contact information for people of that uh, Maronite rite, how they can get in touch with what you're doing there? Firstly, I'd like to thank you, Father Joseph, for the opportunity to be with you on this program. I'd like to thank the EWTN and all the people that they are assisting us in, in this program today. I uh, was pleased to be uh, here today. And uh, the final message that I'd like uh, to say, uh, as a uh, Maronite church, of course, we are uh, very grateful for the, uh, our brothers in the Roman Catholic Church, especially here in Australia, because when uh, we started, uh, they, we have a lot of support, and we still have having a lot of support from them regarding 
our work and our mission. We're very grateful for the, uh, our brothers in the Roman Catholic Church for their assistance and for their support, I'm saying as like bishop conference or clergy or lay people. And at the same time, we say that for our mission here in Australia, uh, I invite uh, the people uh, watching this interview to pray for me and to pray for uh, the Maronite Church in Australia in order to have holy vocation and to continue our mission to praise and glorify the Lord. Well, thank you very much. So uh, good to have you with us today to understand more about the church in Australia, the Maronite Rite. As you can see, the Eastern Catholic churches are making their own valuable contribution in bringing the saving gospel message to others, especially to those of Eastern cultural backgrounds. Each of the rites in the Roman Catholic Church enriches us all in a better understanding of the gospel, which is meant for all peoples, of all cultures, and of all times. We will see you again this time next week for another episode of The Church Universal. <laughs>